welcome to another episode of uh, Wakili Quick One. And uh, we are coming from a very a place that has so many nostalgic moments. Uh, at the Getsi of the famous uh, Kenya School of Law. I mean, uh, everyone who's been to the Kenya School of Law knows what Getsi is. And uh, in our show today, we, ha- we have someone who doesn't need introduction, but either way, because we normally do this, I will have him introduce himself to our viewership. How are you, Dr. Ari? I'm fine, thank you. Karibu sana. Asante. Karibu yourself. Ah, Asante sana. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, I'm uh, Henry Kibet Mutai, uh, the director here at the Kenya School of Law. Now, just before we get into um, how we normally pick our conversations in the show, there's something that is happening today at CLA. What is, what is going on? Um, well, today uh, there are some students, candidates of the bar who um, have some issues with the uh, results of the April bar exams, um, who are going to the CLE to, uh, for clarification of uh, what might have happened. If I can put it that way, I think the hashtag is Occupy CLE. <laughs> you, know, you know, in Gen Z terms, they call it what? Kusalimia, Kusalimia yes. CLE. Yes, Wamenda Kusalimia Secretary of CLE. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so. Let's, let's get uh, right into it. Um, where do you grow up? Uh, I formative grew- areas, Kabisa. Okay. I am born and bred in Kericho, uh, and that's where I started schooling. Um, and uh, my parents still uh, live there, and uh, that's where I call home. Yeah. And um, uh, at that at that time, uh, where do you go to primary school, uh, high school? Um, I started uh, school in Kericho at Kericho Primary School. Um, but I only did part of my primary school there because at the time it did not go up to standard seven. So uh, for standard four, I had to leave and I actually started boarding um, at the age of eight uh, and I went to uh, St. Andrew's School in Turi. Ah. And then uh, did my CPE there, there then. Um, and from there, I came to Nairobi, Nairobi school, I'm a Pacharian, <laughs> did my O-levels there, then did another um, change of school, went to Kikuyu, Alliance High School, <sighs> I'm also a Busherian, uh, and then from there, uh, Nairobi University, Parklands Campus for my LLB. So I've been around. You've been around? Yes. But do you know some, there's someone who's giving Bush a very bad name? Yes, eh? I know that person. He shall remain unnamed. Now, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> you know, you know, a, a few years, a few years back, um, everyone would say, after the introduction, they would say, "Do you know what? I went to the alliance." I but Kumbi, we have some uh, guys in parliament who also went to the alliance. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we are generally proud of alliance. It uh, taught us a lot. Even though I was only there for, for two years, I did make some very good friends that I still keep in contact with now. Um, yeah. So that was for your A-levels? For my A-levels. So, because um, uh, quite a number of um, uh, people who listen to the show, they don't know the difference between O-levels and A-levels. They've never gone uh, uh, through the system. They have no idea how it is. Maybe you can explain what is ordinary levels and advanced levels in a language they might understand. Okay. Um, well, we were in the very last group of A-levelers. So the year after us was when 844 um, started. So under our system, we only did primary child standard seven, did CPE. Then we had six years of secondary school divided into O-levels and A-levels. So four years of O-levels, you do an exam. Uh, then you do, that, that was the KCE, Kenya Certificate of Exam. Then you do two years, you do the KACE, Kenya Advanced Certificate. Um, so in A-levels, you specialized and did either three or four subjects. Um, and then you are examined uh, and that would determine 
um, where you go from there, to, of course, depending on your uh, desire, your results, and so forth. So the system that started after us, of course, the 844, now did eight years of uh, primary, then uh, four of secondary and four of uni. So, so let, me let me just take you back to um, these formative years, because I think they're they also very keen, um, the keen part of the story, uh, not only for our viewers, but also I know for yourself. At what point do you decide, uh, look, I want to become a wakili? Um, I'd say that I had had an interest in law from uh, primary, but at that time I didn't really want to be a lawyer in uh, secondary school. I was considering other options, uh, maybe sciences or uh, something like that. But then by fourth form, when it now came to choosing subjects for A-levels, um, I definitely knew I didn't want to do sciences. Um, I wanted to do the arts and looking forward beyond that, um, law was something that um, was probably top of my list. Maybe if I hadn't done law, I'd have done BCom or something like that, because I also loved economics. Um, but yeah, I think the desire to uh, to be a lawyer, to um, promote access to justice, things like that really drove me. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, cause I think this conversation has, has been, uh, been had by the political class, not, and not in a very holistic way. Uh, how important are the arts in the community? Because I've, I've, we've seen a bit of a crusade coming from certain uh, quarters, preferring um, the sciences, the sciences more and uh, trying even to look at the funding of the universities, trying to um, give a huge chunk of funding to um, the sciences. And I also remember when some of us were growing up, um, the parents were quite biased towards uh, the sciences. Uh, they would uh, try to nudge you in a certain direction to go and do the sciences. So from your perspective of uh, where you've come from, how important are the arts into the society? Uh, they are definitely important to society as a, as a whole. Um, probably what would happen back then was because many of the arts, whether you talk about uh, music, uh, writing, uh, fine arts, the um, jobs, employment was not really uh, there. Those were seen as hobbies, side activities that you did beside your real job, which might be a profession or something else like that. Um, which is why maybe people were discouraged from taking up the arts as a career. But of course, we know uh, um, since then times have, have changed and um, people can now make a, a good living from the arts. Uh, there's a lot that we can learn from arts subjects, not just like the creative arts, like um, music and fine art, but uh, history, uh, geography, um, scripture, philosophy, all those sorts of things. There's a lot that uh, you can learn and apply it in real life. Yeah. So I think that is where today I would definitely encourage uh, someone who wants to follow the arts to, to do so. Ah, yeah. Asante. Now let's now go back to, um, we left it at uh, uh, A levels. Yeah. At that time, were you guys going to NYS? No, we were actually the very first one not to go to Oh, NYS. you were just yeah. the cutoff. So, um, yeah, our year, I guess you can say we had we have the last of a number of things and the first of many. So the last day levels, but the first ones not to go to NYS because uh, the year ahead of us did go to NYS, um, but they discontinued that um, when we finished a level. So when we joined university, we had not had that experience. And I know those who are ahead of us would often say that you guys missed out and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, also many of us who are also saying that then why it doesn't add much value. value so um, we are happy not to to go through it ah. yeah so so what, how how is your campus experience uh, my campus experience was quite enjoyable um i was and have been uh, a bookworm for long so i was one of the ones who'd be 
in the library spending many hours there reading cases, writing notes and so forth. Um, I did not um, go out a, a lot. My, many of my friends would, would do that. Um, but I enjoyed being at, at Parklands. I stayed, uh, obviously at that time, almost all of us were being housed uh, on campus. So I stayed part of the time in main campus, part of the time at, at Parklands, but I finished off in Parklands. Oh, wait. So there was a lot that used to sleep at our main campus. Yes. So, so because the um, hostels in Parklands were not enough for all the students, we were at the time we joined in 1990. We were the largest uh, lot of law students to have been admitted. Yeah. Uh, and the hostels, as I said, in uh, Parklands were not enough. So, um, some both male and female students would stay uh, in main campus at Mamlaka or the other halls and um, be bust every day to Parklands and back again in the evening. Ah, because at uh, the time we were in campus, <clears throat> guys used to sleep at Loakabete, the school of business. And then the bus would pick them and uh, drive, uh, take them to Parklands and uh, back. But that was that used to happen only in first year. Okay. First year, then uh, from second year, the hostels, I think, they could accommodate the huge chunk of um, uh, huge chunk of people. Oh no no yeah. no one was staying at Lokabeta that time. That was purely become. become. Yeah. Ah, ah, all right, all right, all right. Now, you get done with um, Parklands. Look at Dean's list. You know, there's something I hear called the Dean's no, list. No 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 no. I wasn't uh, that. My my reading did not translate <laughs> into <laughs> into Mark, so yeah. I was not on that uh, Dean's list. I just uh, went through as a kawaida. Uh, students uh, graduated and uh, got went off for uh, joined KSL. Of course, at that time we were still on Ralph but Road. Uh, did our um, uh, classes there, then um, pupilage. Yeah. Now, 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 let's talk about KSL. Yeah. But now I want you to speak of KSL from a student's perspective because you're going to talk about it uh, largely from an administrator's point later on. Yeah. What are the stark differences between, of course, here it's a bit expensive, uh, it's so serene. How, what's, what are some of the stark differences between here and uh, where the dental school is today? Uh, well, and also the culture that you had as students and what, uh, and wha what you experienced as, as a student and what you see here from a student's lens. Okay, well, um, physically, of course, you can tell that this is much more expensive and lovely, serene environment and all that. But um, for us at the time, uh, in 1994, when we were joining um, KSL, uh, first of all, there was um, a separation in classes between those who had gone to UON and those who had studied outside the country. So there was one lecture hall with local students would go to and have their classes and there was another stream so we can say two streams the local stream and the foreign stream if you had studied outside kenya whether india or the uk or any other country you were taught separately because they did different units they had to do more subjects than us who had studied uh, locally um so we would only actually see these guys here maju uh, during breaks and so forth, and they would come go to their classes, we would come go to our class. Uh, but at the end of the day, of course, we all did um, the same exam. Uh, they just had a few more papers than we did. And, and, and were the classes that time, were they happening uh, concurrently or were guys coming in the evening? Or, uh -huh. No, they were all day, but I believe, if I'm not wrong, that ours were during the morning and theirs were both morning and evening to cater for the morning and afternoon because they had more subjects, yeah, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. And um, how, how, the period, how long, how long was the period there? Three months. Three months. Yeah. You guys had it, uh, it you was, guys had it, it very nice. It was not very long at all. Hey. Yeah. I don't think it went to six months, yeah. Ah, you guys had it. Uh, yeah, really... we just did the, um, some of us did six subjects, others did five, like if you're done family law at, um, campus, then we didn't have to do it. Some of us had not done family law, so we had to oh. do it um, there. You guys had it uh, quite, quite nice. Yes, yes. I, uh, compared to today's students, um, I, we can't complain. You can't complain. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sasa, you know, we are seated here. 
kuna getsi iko pale this i'm actually seated where for, for guys who understand getsi is the ksl bar it's a very famous spot mkiwa uko kwenu wazia sata facility like this one um a bar no we had a there was a a dining like a cafeteria um but no no bar no bar <laughs> ah so yeah. uh, so again that now is to make cool now yeah what yeah people benefit <laughs> from these days eh uh, and uh, now you you you've, you're done with your Kenya school of law yeah where did you go for pupilage uh i went back home to kericho um an advocate by the name of chelule he was my pupil master uh so i learned in a very small town environment where basically you knew all the advocates in town uh all the other few pupils who are also doing pupilage in kericho uh, the magistrates um so that was the sort of environment that i did my pupilage in so we, we we've had people come into the show and telling us uh they did their pupilage before going to kenya school of law was that the same situation with you god can i remember i think it was after it was after yeah Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Ah, okay. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Mm. But having said that also, by that time I knew that I didn't really want to practice. It was I wanted to be admitted. Yeah. Um, but I did not want to especially not litigation. I just didn't want to do litigation at all. It's good that you've preempted my my, my next and follow-up question. Mm. Um uh, how crucial and how important is the first law firm that a person goes to pupilage important in their outlook in their legal career outlook and maybe how they end up uh, i would not want to speak for others but let me put it this that um it can probably impact on how well you get to know a particular area of law so if you're in a big commercial firm with a lot of uh, commercial um actions uh, and um then you may get to learn a lot about that uh whereas if you're in the practice of someone who does a lot of criminal law a lot of litigation that's what you'll learn more but i think probably by the time you're finishing your undergrad you have a pretty good idea of what sort of area you want to um uh, practicing or what you want to do if you don't want to practice and um pupilage will either for uh, further that or be just a stage where you want to complete in order to be admitted and then go back to what it is that you had wanted so i wouldn't say it determines but it can uh, give you a good foundation if that's the area you want to, to practice Eh uh, sasa now let me put you on spot. Yeah. You get there and realize that you don't really want to um, do litigation and other facets of law that are related. Yeah. Where what what informs that? Um well for me what informed it was as I said earlier I used to love books, love writing, uh, research so the field of academia is one that uh I had already thought about and considered um and doing a masters that's the other thing i wanted to do uh, a masters because i wanted to read and gain more knowledge um so at that stage i was already thinking that uh once i finish once i'm admitted i start looking for somewhere to do my masters yeah so that was part of the thing why i was like i'm not ready to go into practice and uh, work Okay. Yeah. Just uh, uh, I'll just hold on to that master story because we're coming back to it. Mm. Uh let me take you back. During your pupilage experience. No, not not pupilage, your Kenya School of Law experience. Uh, at this time do, uh, are you are you are you guys doing uh, oral examinations? No, the structure was totally different. All this uh, orals and projects came much much later. We were just uh doing our units and then a written exam and that's it then you go to uh, to be a pupilage so um yeah i we did not have firms we didn't do all, all that uh, sort of thing ah uh, uh now i understand that it's 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 like two weeks before oral examination oral. starts yes. right 
I just just I don't know if you've spoken to your students about what to expect. Uh, but maybe now you can take, because I know that by the time um, the oral start, this video will already be, be out. Maybe you can just speak to them, because I know these few weeks it's very tensed up moments. Everyone, everyone is, um, they don't know what to expect. They are tense. Just to allay, to, to, to make them a bit feel a bit um, easy about it. Maybe you can just give them a word of encouragement. Okay, well, um, since I've been here at the school, I've had occasions previous years to... Uh, talk to students about um, morals and well, first of all I think that the current structure of uh, exams actually has quite a number of benefits having your final mark being comprised of your orals your projects and your written work because it means that if your forte is r speaking then you have a chance to gain some marks through the orals uh, if you're good at group work or um, that sort of uh, collective project, then you get a chance to, to work with other people and get the marks there. And then at the end, you've got your, your written paper. Whereas uh, if, so if you're not good at a written exam, everything is not in one basket, where if on that day you have woken up on the wrong side of the, the bed, then you can uh, fail. Here, you've actually got a chance to, to bank some marks before the final paper so that um, depending on how you've done, you already have a good idea that if I get to this point, then I've got my, my P. So as far as orals are, are concerned, I think um, there is a lot of scaremongering out there about um, how it is done and what it means to face the, the lecturers. Uh, and from... First, as an administrator, first of all, let me just make clear, I don't sit in any of the panels, so I don't ask any of the questions, but I have talked with students who have had uh, gone through the orals. I talk with the lecturers, of course, and hear their experiences. And um, I think the aim is always just to test um, how you're able to respond to questions. Of course, the substance is also important if you know what it is that uh, the answer to the questions you've been asked. Um, but how are you able to um, hold yourself out? Uh, being an advocate um, at its core is about advocacy, going before uh, a court, a judge, or a magistrate, depending, regardless of whether eventually you end up um, doing so, practicing in that in litigation, um, you have to have that uh, ability to stand up, speak, answer some questions. So I'd say don't panic if you don't know the answer to a particular um, question. Um, you can pass and have them ask uh, something else. Um, sometimes you hear about people saying, oh, I was asked some very random question that may not even relate to what I've studied. Uh, and from what I gather, speaking with lecturers over the years, sometimes that is done not to put someone on the spot, but to relax. Them. That if they see that you are tense, you're anxious, then they may just ask something, not for purposes of scoring you on it, but just like loosen the mood. Uh, so that's how it should be. Take, don't be like, oh my God, I was ambushed and asked who is the minister for what, who is the current AG. Of course, that's not a question that you're being asked for the purpose of uh, testing the nine units. But um, yeah, maybe like once you speak, once you relax, then you may be able to answer um, better. And at the end of the day, it's, um, there's a, a mark sheet actually that has various components. So even just showing up being dressed neatly, uh, greeting them, you may be able to get two marks or something there, and so on and so forth. So uh, at the end of the day, you can be able to walk out without too much problem having eight, ten marks, even if you have not answered uh, the substantive questions that, that well. So that's how I would look at it. Relax. Don't, don't panic. We are not there to, to fail students. We are just there to uh, test the, the knowledge and their, their readiness. If they have actually grasped um, what they have learned, 
if they will be in a position in a courtroom to answer uh, questions. Yeah, that's the message I'll give. You've actually answered so many questions that I wanted to follow. Because <laughs> uh, I think of, at, at, at some point, um, either last year or the year before that, we, uh, there, was, there was a huge debate on, um, on socials, especially X. And um, of course, I know you might not be privy to this because <laughs> it's, it's my mates and uh, the, those social circles. And, yeah. uh, probably younger, younger students, and they kept on saying that... Uh, how oral exam needs to be relooked at and um, from the lenses that um, there needs to be a sort of a uniformity of because um, guys were arguing that uh, someone might be, might be told to sing this, uh, the national anthem in, the, in this stanza. Another person is uh, asked the process of extradition. So when you put the two on a weighing scale, if people are going to be judged based on that, then be, when you look at it, it becomes one of them is very disadvantaged than the other. But having um, had a conversation about that, you've um, you, you've opened up the process and um, probably answered a few a few more yeah. questions. Because also you need to consider the fact that if you're examining one thousand six hundred people, if you're going to ask the same questions over and over again, then the people who are doing the exams on day one at a big disadvantage compared to those who are doing it in the last week and because you've got nine units that you do here at the school uh, we draw our panels from all our um, lecturers both the full-time and the adjunct some of them will be specialized in one area or the other then um, there's that flexibility in terms of asking a question from uh, any of those units of course also the other point is that we make sure that we all have the curricula um, and the course outline. So we'll ask, or the lecturers will ask up to end of term two. So if a particular um, subject is maybe a term three um, subject, they may not uh, ask about that. But you see that still leaves a whole wide area of um, subject matter that can be covered. So that issue of uh, uniformity, I can see where people would be um, a bit uneasy about it. Uh, but on the other hand, again, um, when you appear in court, you don't know which magistrates, uh, how a particular magistrate will handle a particular issue. If you're appearing for a bench of seven in the Supreme Court, they'll ask, have different ways of asking questions. So it's preparation for that. It's not, um, I will say that, the system is always open to improvement, um, but as it is, that is what the curriculum provides, and we try and make sure that it is as fair as possible to everyone. Ah, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Back to Chelule. Yes. Now, you do Chelule for how many months? Six months. Six months. Yeah. And then from there? Uh, from there, um, admission, after... I should also. I had one reset, oh, dancing. Very, very important. So <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> that's one thing that it's important to always let. That resets have always been there. That you should not feel like it is the end of the world if you have failed one paper. And by the way, when I say I had a reset in convincing, I was shocked. I thought that convincing was probably the easiest of the six papers that I did. Uh, only when the results were pinned up to see an F next to conveyancing and uh, I was in disbelief, but I was like, okay, um, what to do? Uh, and I went and I, I sat it and I passed. And I should also say that of our class of about 200 from the local university, maybe 50 to 100 of the foreign, uh, many of us had at least one, one reason. Uh, it is nothing that reflects badly on you as a Student, uh, it may be a shock, um, but at the end of the day, um, it's a, an obstacle to overcome. Um, and so we sat, we passed, and we were admitted uh, 5th of June 1996. Do you remember who admitted you? The chief justice um, that time? Was it Coca? I think it might be Majid Coca. Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, it was Coca. I think so. Oh. Yeah. 
So I, th- I think our viewers might be wondering what's, what's going on. <laughs> it's because I think we are on, a, on the flight path. On the flight Wilson, path. Yeah. Hey, for Wilson. Yeah. So uh, they need every to go every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I actually had um, I had a receipt. I, I research convincing. And you better research it once. I research it four times. I'm going on a tangent and saying, uh, what do I need to pass this paper? I just, I mean, uh, just keep on holding there. Yeah. Some of us did a paper four times until we passed the last uh, fifth time. Yeah, so. Yeah. No, it happens. I mean, it's, a, it's an exam. You, you may misunderstand a question. You may not put it the way that the examiner wants to put it. Um, your ability. Then it will come through. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Admission. Yes. Yeah. So um, admitted, went back to Kerito to Telula. I tried applying to a few law firms here in Nairobi, but uh, unsuccessfully. Um, so as I said, because I was thinking of doing my master's, I was like, let me go and work in Kerito as I um, make my applications. And uh, soon thereafter, the following year, 97, I went off to the U.S. to do my master's. Yeah. Um, at that time, and, and, and maybe... Actually, was it nine? I think I went to the... Yeah, because I was in the years from 96 to 98. So I went actually almost immediately after. After admission? Yeah. No, no, that's, that's, that's not the crucial bit. I'm, um, I, I want to um, maybe put you on spot. Uh, at what point... Oh, first of all, how crucial is a master's to a student? Mm. And then the second way... The second, at what point should one uh, pursue their masters is it uh is it after you've practiced for a number of years after you've figured out yourself is it uh before going to practice at what point is it at what point as as, as a student of law should you do your masters uh well many factors come into play uh, but i think ideally all else being constant, I'd say do your master's within one or two years of being admitted. While you're still, you've still got the energy um, and you've still got that desire to explore, to learn. Um, after that, once you start working, if you get a good job, the salary is very tempting. Yeah. You start a family, leaving your family becomes hard. Um, yeah, so those other factors start coming into play. And then also, of course, the issue of whether you're doing it locally or you're going outside to do it in a different country. But I'd say ideally just uh, at least to the master's bit, do your LLB, get admitted, then within one or two years, go and yeah. do your master. So you had figured out this is, this is the area of law that I want to do and uh, this is the area I'm going to pursue in my master's? Yes, in general, like generally. Yeah, and that was international law and uh, intellectual property. Intellectual property. Yeah. You're going to come back to that. So you get, you go to states. Yes. You do your LLM. How yes. many years? Uh, it was a one year one LLM year. Uh, oh, oh. in Philadelphia, yeah. Temple University. Temple University. Yeah. Then you come back. Yes. Well, then I did another year there doing um, odd jobs, various uh, jobs, then um, putting some of what I'd learned to practice. I was actually working in a one of the courts as a uh, mediator for some time and other various on jobs. So, yeah. When when did you decide to come back? Uh, when that ended, because um, the option of doing the bar in the US was there, but um, for foreign lawyers, there are only a couple of states that would allow you to do the bar without doing the JD, uh, New York being one of them. Um, but it costs quite a bit to do the bar. It's a lot of work, and I really didn't want to live in the, the U.S. So, um, yeah, the option of doing the bar was one I never seriously considered. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. So you come back to Kenya? Yeah. And uh, are this, when you come back to Kenya, where do you get, um, where do you start working? Are you in typical law firms? Do you get no, into No, no, actually, I've never done practice as such. I think... I came back and uh, at that time, Moy University had started their law school. So we now had two law schools in the country, Nairobi and Moy. Um, and 
I considered which of them to apply to, and at that time Moy was still looking for lecturers. Um, so I applied there, and I got a a job and started off in 1998. For, so for how long have you uh, did you do that uh, being a lecturer at Moy? Um, all together, uh, including the study leave, I was at Moy from 98 to 20. 11. Mm-hmm. But part of that I was away doing my PhD. PhD. Yeah. You told, you know, off the air you told me that you taught my people master is one of your first students. Yes, I taught when I joined mm-hmm. I taught um, fourth years who are the inaugural class of Mo University and uh, even the current Minister for Interior CS Ah, Kindiki was my student. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, and all the other, I think the inaugural class was less than 20 students. So, so you know all of them. You know, yeah. I, I know you. <laughs> yes, yeah. and I've still got their mark sheet somewhere. Somewhere. How they performed in their cards. Oh, yeah. hey, guys, guys, I still have you. Yes. I, I know. <laughs> I know. I know your intellectual capability. <laughs> capability. So, yeah. at that time, uh, you end up, at some point, you end up being a dean now at. Um, at more university. No, 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 I never became dean. I just became oh. a HOD. Yeah. Oh. At some point. Yeah. So I did for three years, then I went off to do my PhD in Australia. Came back in 2000 and end of 2004, 2005. Uh, rejoined and then did a few more years there. Became the head of department. Uh, and then now an opportunity came to move to Nairobi. Nairobi. And that's when I said goodbye to Moy and Eldoret. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in academia, there's a lot of research. A lot of research work goes into uh, whatever it is that uh, either universities are producing or even the people. Mm. Uh, in terms of quality of work, between then and now, in your assessment, because uh, I think the latter years we've had uh, things like half baked, half baked. Uh, uh, students being produced, yeah. and I'm so sure you're privy to such conversations. Yeah. What is your outlook? Um, that issue of uh, half baked students is uh, is one that um, I would say most no one sets out to produce a half baked student first of all, uh, but because of pressures of numbers and resources, you find that sometimes students will not get the sufficient um, attention from the lecturers, Uh, then the students themselves may not have the inclination to put in the work uh, that is needed, Uh, the university may not have the resources um, so you end up finding that the diligent students, the ones who want to learn and to know, will be fine because they will find ways to get books to read. They'll set up. Then the majority will just be ready to go along with what they are given in uh, in their lectures, and some will do the the least possible um, to pass. And the those are the ones who'll end up um, not performing as well as they should. Uh, yeah. Ah, so uh, now you're done with, um, you do more until uh, 2011. Yeah. You come to Nairobi. Yeah. So when you come to Nairobi, where are you coming? Uh, at that time, I was coming to join uh, Kenya Industrial Property Institute as the managing director. Because while I was at um, Moy, IP being one of the subjects that I had studied and that I was um, lecturing. When a vacancy arose, um, some friends encouraged me to apply and cause by that time I now wanted to move to Nairobi for um, personal reasons. Uh, I applied and I was fortunate enough to get offered the, the job. So I moved in 2011 to come and be MD at Kipi. So, so for guys uh, who, do, who don't know these acronyms, IP is Intellectual, intellectual, intellectual Property, property yeah. and KP is Kenya, Kenya Industrial, Industrial Properties, Properties Institute. Institute. That is where yeah. you do, you, you file your 
applications from trademarks yeah patents, trademarks patents you know to, to every kenyan uh anything ip is a patent <laughs> yes i know that's one of the big issues that uh we had to deal with at that time that there is a lot of um lack of awareness with regard to ip issues and um, our journalists do not help because they are just as bad. Yeah. You will read about them talking about patenting a copyright and so forth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, now let's let's get stuck on your tenure at uh, Kipi. How, how 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 long was it? Three years. That three time years. it was a three-year term renewable uh, once, but I just did three. Yeah. Years. You did three years. Yeah. How was your experience? And um, 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 by that I, I mean, how do you leverage your experience, uh, your skills from academia? to Kipi? Um, well, at Kipi, there was, a, at that level, there's a lot of administrative uh, work that you have to, to do. So that was um, something that I had to get used to. Um, but there was also, as the MD, you're also the um, registrar of trademarks, which means you have to hear a lot of uh, cases. So if there are opposition proceedings, you're the one who assists, there's also a legal department which assists that registrar's hearing um, such cases. And also for industrial designs, you're the one who hears uh, some of those cases. So um, that was uh, an interesting and enjoyable part of the job. But yeah, there's just a lot of um, admin work where you're approving budgets, approving uh, activities, preparing quarterly reports, submitting quarterly reports, answering to a board, preparing board papers, a lot of admin work and budgeting work, of course. Yeah. 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 Just, just getting stuck at Kipi story. Why is it that Kenyans on other Kazi Akili? Because intellectual property is a lot of um, creations of the mind, yeah. right? Why is it that we have very few applications for trademarks, few applications for patents, few applications for utility models, design models, a copyright in, in your assessment because um, having taught students this kind of aspect and uh, mm. now coming to keep it what, what, what do you think is the disconnect why don't we why are, no, are we not that kind of a nation uh well first of all i think with regard to trademarks there are actually very many trademarks that are um, applied for and registered so people are now aware of the importance of branding and protecting your brand in terms of uh, having a trademark uh, for patents, industrial designs, I think the issue is, first of all, that it's a very complex area of, of law, um, technical in nature. So we, for a long time, have lacked uh, that technical capacity um, to assist people who are um, inventive to protect their inventions. Uh, we also need a lot of money to carry out research in order to come up with the something that is new and original enough to deserve um, protection. Um, then, of course, we have the culture of uh, uh, stealing, borrowing, copying, <laughs> um, so that uh, someone, the, the enforcement aspect is, uh, is lacking, because um, intellectual property is a private right. You have to, as the owner, take the initiative of protecting it. And if you're not going to do that, then the state is not going to uh, step in on your behalf. Still, still I'm still stuck at Kipi. Mm. Um, and now it's good that you've mentioned that uh, intellectual property is a private, um, a private right. Um, an entity, let me not, call, let me not say, uh, hiving off is not the correct word. But anti-counterfeit uh, agency, uh, in my assessment, and I could be wrong, was hived off from uh, Kipi. No, you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was created totally independently. Yes. Kipi. Yeah. I, I, yes, and uh, that's that's what I'm still getting at. Yeah. In from where you see it, uh, it should have been a part of part of Kipi. Uh, there's also another agency now we call Kenya in National Innovation Agency, Kenya. In my assessment, it's it should be part of Kipi. Um, and there was a bill that sought to consolidate mm. all these entities together. Yeah. 
And now, because uh, the government is broke and there's austerity, the president has hinted at uh, consolidating some, uh, some of these agencies into one. Do you think time is right for us to have all these agencies under one roof? Um, well, that idea or proposal actually goes back to the time that I was in Keep It, that commission that President Kenyatta had established to look into the many sagas, uh, semi parastatos that exist. And the proposal was made to consolidate KIPI and counterfeit and Kenya Copyright Board. Um, it's not gone through to date. And personally, um, speaking now from my personal IP perspective, having been uh, in KIPI, having also been a director at Kenya Copyright Board, and knowing what the mandates of each are, I don't think I would uh, agree that it's a, it's a good idea because the stakeholders, um, the sectors that they serve are so different that um, having them in one institution would not serve the stakeholders well, especially the creative sector, the copyright sector, because um, I believe that it would mean creatives get um, sidelined to a certain extent. Because if you're aware of intellectual property, to get your industrial property rights, whether it's trademarks, um, patents, industrial design, utility models, you have to register it. It's mandatory to get protection. Whereas for copyright, it's not mandatory. Um, so it's uh, something that is optional, it's encouraged, and Kekoba has a very good process for registering. Um, but because of that, you don't really um, have to interact as much with the copyright board if you're someone in that sector as you would have to do with the, um, with the KIPI. And then purely from a monetary now budget perspective, because you realize once you work in some of these institutions, there are some very practical elements that you have to consider. Um, for KIPI is able to generate a large chunk, if not 100% of its uh, budget. Whereas the Kenya Copyright Board and that counterfeit rely to a great deal on um, government support. So if you're all in one institution, the natural tendency will be to look after the sections that generate income, especially if you're told that your only income is coming from here. So if your people in the trademark section say they need something, you'll take care of them. If your patent examiner say they need something, that is where your focus will be. The others, you'll be like, what do you want? Sensitization. You want to go and uh, educate people. That is money going out, not coming in. Um, so you'll find there would be a, a tendency to, to do that, no matter if it has, if it's even considered an equal department and all that. Uh, and also we find that, um, because at that time, it's the question that we looked at myself and the heads of the other organizations, that we were actually, it's best practice to have them separate. So it would be going backwards if you now go back to having them all within one um, body. So um, let's wait and see what happens. But uh, I think that is one reason why 12 years after the original suggestion, there's nothing that has yeah. come of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know you had a center at Kenya Copyright Board. Just as a board member. As a board member. Yeah. Now it's, 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 it's even, because uh, now I'm going to get And I've actually also short. been a board member at Anti-Counterfeit. By virtue of being the MD at Kipi, ah, there was a... You could, uh, the, the MD of Kipi was one of the board members. Ah. At the but that was yeah. short lived because the law was changed after that. And yeah. I left Kipi anyway. So at Kikobo, every year we always have a fight between um, the board and CMOs. Yeah. CMOs is collective uh, management of the uh, organizations. Organization. Yeah. The camp, uh, the priest, the MCSK. Even now, as we speak, there's always going to be a push and pull. Yeah. And there's always going to be a conversation about the artists. 
some artists after <laughs> after all that hard work during the year mm. their royalties come to about 2000 <laughs> yeah 2800 shillings what what is that sector is it that so much money goes into administrative costs is it mismanagement of funds what what is really the there are so many factors that go into it and um yeah that fight with kekobo the cmos uh has been going on for years and years i think one of the in my estimation one of the big problems the fact that cmos uh operate under two legal regimes they are regulated by kekobo but they are companies so they have people who are members like the ones who will elect the officials and run the company as a company which is supposed to be regulated by uh, now it's brs previous there is twelve company so there are certain things that kikobo may not be able to do or enforce um, which impact on how it operates so if you have that governance breaking down then it spills over so if they can resolve the governance issues my view is that that sector would uh, flourish but so long as governance issues exist then um, our creatives will continue languishing haya turudi kwa story yako tena so you stay at kipi for three years yes uh you exited which year 2014 2014 yes yeah, where so, do you go um well i just went nominally back to uh, well i didn't really resume back at moin but because i had been on unpaid leave but at that point i submitted my resignation because i didn't want to go back to eldoret and um i started doing various things within nairobi consultancy uh um and then part time teaching adjunct teaching uh i was at uh, catholic university as an adjunct but not in the faculty of law at the institute for regional integration and development here it um i was also at riara part time uh yeah various consultancies in ip yeah so i did that again for about four years then the opportunity arose here at the school and again some friends encouraged me you think you'd be a, a good fit good fit why don't you put in your papers which i did came and got interviewed and uh i got the, the job so joined in march 2018 march 2018 just just before we we get into here because there are a few things that you know you have to talk about here mm. w- w- are you associated with prospect ip is it Pros- prospect ip um no well there was a time uh, a friend of mine was trying to set up that uh, institute that company yeah um but we never got very far oh. yeah so it was we were trying that was actually one of the things we wanted to to do at that time to try and grow ip in in the country um so get together with a couple of like minded friends and uh, try and set up a specialized intellectual property uh, firm that would offer legal advice and various legal services for IP but yeah no it didn't really get off so yeah all right let's get in here now mm. so you you join here in 2018 yes Kenya School of Law uh, every person who's coming from campus is always told when the Kenya School of Law why <laughs> it's a there's always a dread that yeah. comes uh, I don't know if it's because it's a one year of uh, where you have to unpack everything. Mm. I don't know why why do we have such there are always so many fears from uh, the time you were jo- uh, you're coming from campus to join Kenya School of Law. What is it? Um I think that it is the fact that uh, this is it's probably the when you know that this is the final hurdle that you have to jump to be admitted um and so it feels like there's a lot riding on it a lot at stake 
Uh, and if you do not make this final hurdle, then it can seem as if all your previous training um, is futile, like it's gone to to waste. So um, the stakes are considered to be very high, the nine subjects. Then, of course, being human beings, people will always focus on the uh, the negative stories. So if you hear that people fail, they have to reset and all this then. Uh, that thing of anxiety, will I make it, will I be one of the the lucky few will be going through people's minds. Yeah. So that is I think that is where a lot of the anxiety comes, comes from. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's also the question where, and I, I think we've seen this uh, play out in the uh, public gallery, where you have um, are people allowed to do the undergraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, certain universities, they'll take you in, you'll do your undergraduate for four years, yeah. but becomes a challenge to admit them to the Kenya, to Kenya School of Law. Mm. For example, someone didn't perform well in a certain subject. What, what, how can we resolve that? Okay. Well, the issue there is the KCSE results, not really the university. Yes. And it's a question of law. What is uh, on our law? So um, prior to the Kenya School of Law Act coming into force, being enacted and coming into force, the then regulations under the Council of Legal Education allowed for progression. So if you did not get the mean of C plus and B in English or Swahili and uh, um, mathematics, yeah, KCSE, then you had a path of going through a diploma or having done a bachelor's in another um, area to go and do law and then come to the school. Sometimes some people would still have to do pre-bar um, before being admitted. But when the KSL Act was passed, it now set out in the act itself the fact that you must have a C plus and a B in English or Swahili as the minimum entry grade. Um, so regardless of if the university has admitted you for LLB, because remember, university admission is governed by Q and the university. They are the ones who decide who they're admitting. The parliament had said, fine, you'll do that, but to come to do the ATP, the Advocate Training Program, you must have that minimum. So all of a sudden you had people, a situation where someone would come and do a pre-bar, having done their diploma and be admitted to being told, no, you cannot, law has changed. You have to have this minimum, regardless of what else you have done. Uh, and that is the situation that we find ourselves in now, that people complain that the school is the one locking us out, they are acting as gatekeepers and so on and so forth. Um, but the school implements what is in the law. We cannot behave as if parliament did not change the law in 2014 and continue to apply the old criteria and say, we shall administer the pre to you and then you, you come. Because parliament said, no, you must have the C+. plus. So that is a debate that has been going on basically since I joined started even before I, I joined, um, because at that time there were still transition issues from the old legal regime to the new legal regime. We've had bills being introduced in parliament. If you were to gather a group of 10 lawyers, you'd probably get 10 different views as to what should be done. Um, but that is what that is, that particular issue is all about. Now, on, in terms of a um, curriculum, Mm. Um, you've been um, a lecturer at the university and here now. Uh, from my experience in university, there was a lot of theory. Yeah. It was, we were, a lot of theory was hammered in us. Yeah. You come to Kenya School of Law, you have to unlearn so much in terms of drafting, in terms of, uh, it's, it takes a, a practical example. Yeah. You go to practice, it takes a different format. Do you think it's time we harmonize some of these things? <laughs> uh, that's an interesting question because um, universities are academic in nature. So you're actually learning, I would say, 
the reason why things certain things are the way they are uh, and to critique why if it's this way why is it that way why is it it's some other way and so forth and analyze and so forth um atp ksl is supposed to be clinical in nature it is clinical in nature we are now going on to the nitty-gritty of leave aside your theory how do you actually draft an application uh, how do you draft an affidavit how do you draft your conveyance whatever it is so you're not being asked um, questions of why is men's rare important in criminal yeah that's not that's now like if you've got a charge sheet how do you draw a charge sheet what uh, are the elements in the, the charge sheet and so on and so forth um and those things are as i said very nitty-gritty in nature um they may not be suitable i know there was a time when um, uh, graduates from the local universities did not have to do any subjects here at the school they just got privileged and admitted for a few years then the system was changed and they were, had to come back and i think that's because it was realized that the universities did not have the capacity or it was not in their um, curriculum to teach some of those uh, clinical aspects of of law um, and even now i still hear and the debate is still there whether um, universities should teach everything uh, and then they do pupillage and so on and so forth um, but the fact is there may be people who want to do an llb as a second degree or first degree with no intention of ever um, practicing so um, for them that would be a needless like a waste of time to the same way that one could argue that someone comes here and they are like i know i'll never practice criminal law why do i have to do criminal litigation um, but um, it is there as one of the elements now maybe when there's a um, a debate or a discussion as to what subjects should be taught at uh, the ATP, that discussion can be revisited. But uh, I think there will always be different viewpoints. If you travel again um, globally, you'll find different countries have different systems. So we as Kenya need to decide what works for, for us uh, and our circumstances. <coughs> There's also the conversation that um, there's a disconnect between uh, Kenya School of Law and the Council of Legal Education. And maybe one of the reasons why every year we see a huge number of people not getting 9Ps is probably attributed to that. Maybe the difference in what is being tested and what is being taught. What, what, what is... Uh, yeah, my take on that. Yeah. That is a, a perspective of view that people have had for some time after the separation of the two. But I would say that if there was any such a split, um, and of course you have to reiterate the fact that we are the ones who train, CLE are the ones who examine. So the examination mandate is completely theirs. But we work together closely to make sure that when they are asking the setters to set the exam, we have shared with them the course outlines, we have shared with them the curriculum, uh, and they are aware of what is being um, taught so that they can set based on what is uh, taught here. So you'll not have um, an unpleasant surprise where something that is not in the course outline is being asked. And I think the results over the last four years, three, four years, um, bear that out. I think in November last year, the November results were probably the best results um, in many, many years uh, at the school. Many, quite a number of the subjects had over 90% pass rate. Um, so that issue of um, a disconnect between the CLE and the school is I would say. Now, uh, um, a few months ago, no, a few days ago, we had a phenomenon called the uh, Kenya School of Law President. Yes. Now, in our days, 
and I'm so sure I speak for so many people. Mm. We had never heard of such a such an occurrence. We've yeah. never had a president. Mm. We've never had a Kenya. I hear now there's a Kenya School of Law Council. Yeah. Uh, maybe tell us uh, some of the changes that have come. I also hear that there's also a lot of guidance and counseling that is happening around Kenya School of Law. Some of these things were hard during our times. What has what has informed some of the? Just maybe talk about the changes and maybe what has informed uh, the changes that have uh, resulted well, in that. When I joined, I found the Student Governing Council system in place. So it has been there for some time. But uh, I think the basic rationale for that is just to have um, channels for the students to communicate with the management, um, for the students to organize themselves where uh, needed because the numbers again um, this year we've admitted about 1,600 students we said when I joined we were 200 from the Nairobi University which was the largest class uh, to that point plus the ones who came from foreign universities and the numbers have been growing over the years so you can see that there would need to be some form of system uh, in place where there's a structured way of communicating with uh, students. So the council is actually just made up of the class reps from each of the different streams. Again, that's uh, something that um, may uh, not be there for, may not have been there for people who studied in the 80s or 90s. So you've got different streams, each elects one male, one female class rep. Then the class reps make up the student governing council and they elect from amongst themselves uh, a president. So it's not a president who is elected by the student body. It's just like the one who will be the leader of the student council. Ah, yeah. No, I think we are coming to and the And counseling. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is uh, actually something that, uh, now we recruited the student council in my time here. And it, over the years, it had become quite apparent due to those some of those reasons you have mentioned earlier about the stress of being at the school the pressure um, that students were experiencing issues that required some form of counseling, some form of guidance. And we did not have uh, such a, a position, such an um, officer amongst the staff. So uh, it became apparent that it was a critical area of need um, to have someone specifically who can listen to the students, guide them, offer counseling. Uh, and uh, so the board approved the, the inclusion of a student counselor in the organogram. And then later we sought the relevant approvals to ac actually recruit and we now have one. And um, I must say she's uh, quite busy and it is uh, proving to be a, to have been a very um, prudent decision to take to, to have a student counselor. Uh, <coughs> perfect. Now, we're coming to the tail end of this interview. Another this conversation. Uh, there is something that um, a parliament enacted and cabinet had, um, had a hand in it, where um, Kenya School of Law was to have a sort of decentralization. Mm. Uh, how is that process? How, how, how far is it? And are we seeing... Uh... Yeah, well... Um... First, in the school's strategic plan, the current strategic plan, we do want to open at least two campuses um, around the country locations to be determined by feasibility studies uh, with the goal of taking government services closer to the people as the constitution requires. Um, so there are some people who are who are arguing for a liberalization rather than a decentralization so that other universities offer, or other institutions, let me say, offer the, the advocates training program. We are of the view that if the school is facilitated, then it can open campuses uh, around the country to cater for um, such uh, decentralization, taking services to the people. Uh, but it requires resources. I think we are all aware of the current financial situation in the country <laughs> yeah. where we may not be able to actualize some of our ambitions, um, but that is our goal as a, as a school to open one or two 
uh, campuses. Although I should also mention here that we have approached this from another area as well, which was triggered by COVID, where we had to go online, which is another innovation that was not there before, and which I think before 2000, if anyone asked you the ATP online, they'd looked at you, have looked at you and thought you're crazy. But force of circumstances, like all our other sectors, we went online. It is proving to be very successful. About half of our students are learning online from all around the country. Um, so even that, now, even now, we've maintained the online classes even after the pandemic ended. Let's say. So, um, in terms of access to our programs, you could be sitting in Busia, in Malindi, in Lamu, and attending classes. We even have some who are following from outside the the country. So, we believe there are different ways of approaching this and that is one of the ways we have done it. So I'm, I'm just curious, <laughs> I'm just curious. So who qualifies for online class and who doesn't qualify for online it's class? It's uh, optional. You, de you decide when you're registering, you say, do you want to attend physical classes or do you want to attend online classes? And if you want to do online, you'll be assigned a particular class and then uh, you take your classes online. But once you stuck, once you say I'm doing physical, you're doing physical. Yes, you because can't of say the I'm farms doing... and all, you, we can't change you from one mode to the other. And how, how, how is the uptake for online? Uh, about half of our students are doing online classes. So about 800 of our 1600. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Mm. Hey, hey, hey. So a lot of changes, a lot of yeah. developments here. So I wanted us uh, to do the last last two questions, yes. which is the more fun uh, aspect of this interview. Uh -huh. But Kibo, I wanted us to walk. <laughs> to the bar. To the bar, <laughs> as we talk. Yeah. But is it, I don't know if it's even open. No, no, no not, it's, it's okay. I just yeah. want uh, for to memory's sake. Yeah. yeah, all right. Yeah. As, you, as you're having that conversation so that we wind up there. Remember, camera will even. <laughs> yes. Do we, will we, we walk with we it. We walk with it. <laughs> <laughs> you've been teaching students here. What? Uh, no, no, no. You, no. You've been teaching students much <laughs> of your life. Yeah. Not here. Mm. What uh, what is one key advice you give a student, either student of law, not only just a student, because um, if you've been um, uh, in the practice of law, whether in academia, administrator for so long, you've interacted with so many facets of law. What makes one succeed in the practice of law? Uh, well, from what I have seen uh, and observed and talked with the colleagues, yeah. Uh, you have to work hard. Uh, you have to be a, have integrity um, if you are to last. Because without integrity, you may make a quick buck, yeah. but it will, not, it will not last. Your reputation will suffer, and um, yeah, clients will shun you in the end. Um, so hard work, integrity, and then continuous learning. You have to keep up to date with the latest developments in the law because. Um, new laws are being uh, enacted all the time, cases are being decided. Uh, so if you don't, don't keep up, you will become irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah, so that, those I think would be my uh, three words. You work hard, integrity, um, keep up to date, and of course your networks. In law is a, a profession of uh, contacts, networks, um, the personal Connection, connections you have. So uh, build and maintain your networks. Ah, great. Now, my last question. We are coming to one of my favorite places at the Kenya School of Law when I was here. Uh, for guys who did COVID uh, and they have never interacted with the bar, <laughs> this is the Kenya School of Law bar. Kevin, I think you can show them. This is uh, the building we call GC. Now, how important is um, work-life balance? to any individual, either, either as a student or as a practitioner. And also you can tell us what you probably do for fun when you're not, uh, when you're not a bookworm. <laughs> well, um, work-life balance is very critical because as I just uh, mentioned, when we're employing the counselor, got a, there's a lot of things in this world that will stress you out. And not maintaining a work-life balance is one of those things that can have a very adverse impact on your health. So 
you need to get time away from your books. You need to have time away from your work once you're working. Uh, to go out, listen to music, go for a run, meet up with friends, anything like that, so that um, you de-stress, you decompress from the um, all the the stresses of day-to-day -day, uh, life. And as for what I do myself, uh, well, I love to travel. Um, I watch a lot of sports because. Uh, having gone to the different schools that I mentioned at the beginning, sports was always a key aspect of the school life. And I got to love sports. I played, of course, back when I was in school. Since then, not so much. Uh, then, um, yeah, working out exercise, either jogging or recently I've joined the, the gym. As you know, as you get older, you have to, uh, to work harder yeah. at keeping yourself uh, healthy. So I'd say that's what I do. I mean, uh, there's no better place to end this interview than uh, the famous uh, Kenya School of Law Club. Kevin, show them here. Yep. Kenya this School of Law Bar. <laughs> this is a favorite of many people. And um, I want you to look at that camera and say, Wakili, quick one. Wakili, quick one. Thank you. Tumeru Kainze. <laughs>